uh, the sort of nomenclature, uh, the uh, categorization, uh, um, how we actually define um, uh, this incredible uh, um, and dynamic uh, group, this population that uh, that uh, we call Latino, we call uh, Hispanic. So again, thank you for showing up. Uh, and uh, I'd like to just quickly um, uh, introduce the theme today. Uh, again, it's uh, called Legacies, uh, Colonialism, and Immigration, and Latino, uh, Latina, Latinx uh, Identity. Um, and again, at the uh, uh, um, core of this here uh, is this idea uh, of this uh, unfolding history that informs the experiences of the panelists that I'll be introducing to you shortly, uh, and how that um, uh, has in, informed, uh, influenced, and impacted uh, the various experiences. Um, <clears throat> So again, welcome and welcome all of you that are uh, coming right now. My name is uh, Dr. Roberto Herrera. Uh, I am an arch anthropological archaeologist uh, working uh, at McGarvis College. And um, eh, as Latino, or as I prefer, mezclado, which has its own uh, um, eh, reasons, um, eh, one of the things that uh, I find uh, very important uh, as an archaeologist and anthropologist is looking at the deep history of Latino culture, Hispanic culture. And, and here during this month, we have the opportunity to sort of emphasize that, but also look at the diversity, the variety of experiences uh, moving forward. So um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is actually, uh, in the time that we have here, um, do a brief introduction uh, of our panelists for today. Uh, we have uh, the esteemed immigration commissioner, uh, Manuel Castro, who uh, will be joining us. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, we have uh, Christina Chala uh, from the Medgar Evers ASAP program here. Um, we have uh, Jennifer Hernandez uh, from Make the Road New York, uh, um, I, and uh, Teresa Feliciano, uh, uh, Latinx PhD candidate within the CUNY Grad Center. Uh, also an anthropologist, so uh, I'll be leaning uh, on her a little bit in terms of the, uh, um, her experiences there. But everybody here um, has their own particular experiences uh, that uh, I want to definitely touch upon. I want to sort of uh, um, explore um, as permitting, time permitting. Um, in addition uh, to uh, these four esteemed panelists, we also have a pre-recorded statement uh, um, by uh, the U.S. Secretary of Education, uh, Miguel Cardona. Uh, and so uh, what I'd like to do uh, is uh, uh, run that, that uh, pre-recorded statement first so that we can all see that and sort of use that as a jumping off point uh, to um, sort of consider what he says and sort of add to that and and then and sort of uh, extract a, a series of, of questions that we can all explore here with the panel. Uh, and so we'll do that. Uh, we will field questions. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, hopefully as uh, all of you are listening to this, you will have um, questions that pop up. So write them down uh, so that you can um, it, <clears throat> ask the panelists uh, as, as we get towards the end of, of the session here. So again, thank you all. Uh, I see a, a great number of you there, including many of my students. Thank you very much. Um, and um, let me uh, quickly uh, share my screen here. Uh, uh, and again, this is very timely. It's always very timely to talk about um, sort of heritage and the sort of the diversity of what some people call Latinidad, right? Uh, and there are many ways to sort of talk about this. Um, uh, and uh, because of that diversity, it is a challenge, but it is also a strength, right? And so I will let um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Secretary uh, Cardona uh, speak here um, and share his thoughts. Feliz Mes Nacional de la Herencia Hispana. As America celebrates National Hispanic Heritage Month, we uplift our vibrant Latino communities and draw strength from our immigrant roots. This month and every day, we recognize Latino accomplishments and our commitment to build a brighter future for our communities. Importantly, we also honor the sacrifices of generations that came before us. Mis abuelos did that for me. They exchanged up 
paradise of Puerto Rico for the projects in Connecticut just so that their children could have better opportunities. Their sacrifice deepened my connection to my Puerto Rican heritage and shaped my perspectives as a son, brother, husband, father, community member, educator, and as Secretary of Education. Latinos are a thriving force, and we are woven into the tapestry and history of America. We are vital to government, to military service, to the workforce, and to our economy. We embody the best of American values, industrious, determined, patriotic, resilient. These values are the building blocks for prosperous and healthy communities. I'm so heartened by the progress we're seeing in Latino communities, but we still have a lot of work to do. That starts by unapologetically addressing longstanding inequities across systems in America, including the system of education. I'm proud that the Biden-Harris administration is supporting the Latino community through the American Rescue Plan and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. And with the president's targeted debt cancellation announcement, additional relief could free one in three Latinos from student debt totally. That's a game changer. We've provided $11 billion to our Hispanic serving institutions with an additional $8 million toward expanding teacher preparation pathways. Necesitamos maestros Latinos. After all, our Hispanic institutions are vital to Latino student success. Feliz Semana Nacional de las Instituciones al Servicio de los Hispanos. We've also built partnerships to attract and keep excellent diverse educators in our classrooms so more students see themselves reflected in their mentors and in their community leaders. And we've transformed public service loan forgiveness from a promise broken to a promise kept. To all our dedicated public servants, be sure to apply by October 31st. Visit pslf.gov for more information. To the families and communities who support public service, mil gracias. Sus sacrificios, apoyo y trabajo también está contribuyendo a nuestro gran país. Let's celebrate the promise and achievement of Latinos during Hispanic Heritage Month and every month. Palante. Thank you, Secretary Cardona, uh, for that um, recorded statement there. And there's a lot there that oh, um, I want to sort of, uh, um, I want us to think about uh, as a panel, um, I want to sort of expand upon this. Um, um, chiefly there um, is this idea of a tapestry that, that he, he mentions in the beginning, this idea that it's woven into American culture. And so uh, I want us to uh, think about that, um, that tapestry and how it is composed, what it's composed of. What is that legacy uh, that leads to that warp and that weft um, uh, in, in, our, in our country and, and, <clears throat> and beyond, right? So part of that, as I said, has a, a deep antiquity, right? Uh, and, and, and part of that uh, is not necessarily uh, um, a, spoken of or, or, or mentioned very often, right? And so what I'd like to do is just sort of uh, um, highlight uh, this deep antiquity um, and <clears throat> go over um, the, the legacies that predate colonialism uh, and that inform immigration and identity in general. So I just want to briefly uh, share my screen one more time and just uh, draw your attention to the diversity of Latino identity, of Hispanic identity, of Latinx identity, right? And as you can see here um, <clears throat> in the splash screen, um, this is Latino identity. This is just a, a fraction of Latino identity, right? Uh, the, the actual uh, um, antiquity in the Americas goes back thousands of years, right? And that is something that is a, an integral part of, of, of Latinidad or Hispanidad, right? What you see on the left is a, is a brief sort of summary, a, a geographic summary of the, the breadth of Latin America, including uh, um, North America, right? Uh, and of course we have uh, the, the ancient cultures of Mesoamerica and South America and the Andes. And, and to the right, you see the Caribbean with the original place names that still exist 
uh, uh, in many cases in, in, in modern uh, language, right? From IT, Cuba, to Jamaica, right? Uh, I have students of mine that uh, looked at this slide and they're like, that's, that's my island. I'm like, yes, it is. And it goes back uh, um, hundreds, if not thousands of years in terms of its deep antiquity. So that is something that is, is vital uh, to uh, understanding in, to some degree, this, this phenomenon of Latinidad. Again, there's these deep cultures ranging from South America to Mesoamerica, like Oaxaca, to Central America and parts of Colombia that you see here, right? Um, <clears throat> again, with the Caribbean cultures that uh, may sometimes uh, um, exist just under the surface or are celebrated uh, uh, to uh, uh, an incredible extent, as we see here in Puerto Rico, uh, the existence of ball courts, and also elements that show uh, an emphasis uh, that might not necessarily be uh, associated uh, uh, with Latinidad or certain aspects of Hispanic culture, depending on various contexts that exist, right? Such as the emphasis on, on matriarchy, on, on the female uh, identity, uh, uh, <clears throat> things that had to contend with the, uh, uh, the coming together uh, of core elements uh, of, of Latino culture, the European components, the indigenous components uh, that make up for it. This particular slide here, I love because it is an example of uh, Afro-Latinidad, uh, which shows uh, uh, three uh, um, uh, Afro-Latino uh, brothers who had indigenous mothers, uh, um, <clears throat> an African-American father, uh, but are wearing European clothing. If there's anything that's emblematic uh, of of this sort of mezcla, if you will, it's definitely these three hermanos for sure. And it is something that uh, um, is part of the, the modern uh, um, Latino or Hispanic experience. And, and lastly, I want to, uh, with respect to colonialism, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the casta system. And it's something that I want us to, uh, as a panel, think about uh, in our experiences, how that sort of gradation of identities uh, has or has not affected our own experiences, Latino experiences, Hispanic experiences, uh, uh, in their interaction with each other, right? What you see here in this, in this uh, um, slide literally sets up this sort of hierarchy uh, depending on the different sort of admixture, right? The, the, the combination of different features uh, to make up various types of Latinos or Hispanics. And this feeds into this idea of uh, uh, identity, right? This idea of uh, um, a, a gender and orientation also is something that has a deep antiquity, uh, whether we were speaking of two-spirit, whether we we're speaking of concepts, uh, indigenous concepts that uh, speak towards a, a duality of spirit uh, that may or may not be uh, um, embraced in various pockets of culture. It's something that is nonetheless uh, integral uh, to this conversation, this discussion of identity. Uh, and uh, legacy, right? And so again, the diversity is what makes this so uh, challenging, uh, at times contentious, uh, uh, but extremely important. Uh, I don't have enough time to go into the, the broad diversity right? because I'm touching upon the indigenous, the Afro-Latino, uh, uh, the aspects of identity having to do with, with uh, uh, gender identity and, and and with uh, various aspects that um, may or may not be embraced in, in, in Latin culture, but it is something that I want us to sort of consider uh, moving forward. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I want you all, not just the panelists, but I want everybody uh, that is uh, um, uh, generous enough and, 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 and uh, welcomed here in this group to think about these ideas uh, um, that I speak of, what makes up this tapestry, right? Uh, and so what I'd like to do is uh, speak to uh, um, a, the panelists starting off with uh, uh, Commissioner Castro and, and just sort of ask a question, it'll be to all of them, right? Uh, the series of, of questions, uh, what has been your experience given aspects of this legacy? Uh, are there any uh, of these aspects that resonates with your own experience, with your own uh, um, uh, engagement uh, uh, with identity as, as Latino, as Latinx or Hispanic? And do any of these issues resonate within your own family history, your own personal experience? So this is something that I pose to all the panelists, but I'd like 
uh, um, <clears throat> I like uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Castro to sort of uh, um, begin this uh, discussion. Thank you, Professor Herrera and uh, the organizers of this, this wonderful event and to all the students who join us today. Uh, my name is Manuel Castro. I'm the commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, and uh, Professor, thank you for the presentation. This is a, it's just great, great way to, to open up and, and get us in the mind, mindset to, to have this discussion. I'd say, uh, you know, there are different ways I can respond to this, but what continues to come to my mind uh, doesn't really have to do with my role as commissioner. Um, I grew up uh, uh, undocumented. I was part of the dreamer movement for a long time. And um, it, what came to mind when you were discussing um, or, you know, the, the legacy of colonialism, uh, I kept thinking about the displacement of people uh, from their lands and from, from their, their, you know, their communities uh, that led really uh, to, to the first uh, sort of movement of people uh, as a result of, of um, let's say, social and economic uh, impacts, right? Um, and so when I learned that I was uh, undocumented, well, first of all, I crossed the border with my mother when I was five. And so that's, you know, that was always in my mind. But when I was uh, uh, perhaps in, in high school, that really sort of dawned on me what it meant to be undocumented because I could not participate in many of the activities my my friends uh, were, were able to participate. And one of the first things that... Uh, that I really uh, that really attracted me was this sort of like thinking about the history of of uh, Latinos and of you know folks in my situation and and what that meant to be in this position that I was in in my family and so uh, a lot of what I learned uh, in those years really came about from reading and studying this and then learning about. Uh, social justice movements that came out of those legacies uh, as a result of, of the displacement of people in colonialism, and then eventually here in the United States in the fight to expand rights and, um, and justice for the communities that I belonged and other, other people who had struggled uh, for full citizenship. Uh, and so uh, that comes to mind, and that really is the sort of the legacy both, you know, the the sort of uh, the what you described uh, that I come from, and also the resistance and the movements that came from them, and, and you know, I was I was appointed commissioner in part because of my activism, uh, leading uh, nonprofit organizations and being part of social movements, and so that's what I'll share. Uh, but thank you so much for bringing that up and and eliciting this this sort of. Uh, uh, the, these feelings that that uh, that I'm sharing today. Uh, only uh, the last thing I'll say is that it really, it really is us standing on top of, of, in the shoulders of of so many people that have come before us, uh, and struggling with these ideas and, and and the impacts of of our legacies, our histories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, I, uh, I am... There's a lot that I will return to you, uh, given the time uh, that I'm already thinking and writing down furiously. But um, I'd like to uh, um, sort of bring that question up as well uh, um, to uh, Christina Chala with respect to again um, the 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 your experiences, your sort of your your ontology, your reality as it is informed by by these. Uh, um, Different aspects, and what you know. This what's great is knowing that there is a variety of aspects here. Many people will think of Latino or Hispanics as this monolith, and it's very, very, very much not the case. And so, uh, uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well, Christina. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, I'm taking notes on little post-its. There's so much that we can talk about and are talking about today. Um, this is whole majors, right? 
not just a conversation today. And that's, I'm struggling with that a little, but I'm Christina Chala, um, the ASAP career specialist at Medgar Evers College, but I'm also uh, one of the representatives for Medgar on the CUNY LGBTQI plus council. Um, so I chair our outreach subcommittee for the whole CUNY LGBTQI council. So I have two hats sort of, but things that are relevant that are bringing, I'm bringing to the table today. Um, I'm from California originally um, and I'm Arab Latina, Chilena, Arabe Chilena um, from California. And in high school, I took Latin American history as part of my high school curriculum. Um, and I majored and after I transferred from community college to my uh, bachelor's degree institution in women and gender studies, which was a critical theory major, we had to learn about critical race theory in my major in women and gender studies. Um, so Intersectionality is integral to my educational experience, and I'll say my education transformed me. Um, besides my degree, what I, I've shared, some of my students are here. Thanks for being here. Um, so some folks may have heard my story before, but um, I was also in an HEOP equivalent at my college, like SEEK, SEEK at Medgar Evers, or any HEOP higher education opportunity program. Um, I was in a similar program at UCLA, my undergraduate institution, and I I was a tutor in women's studies in that program. So my critical theory major and then doing my work study job as a tutor, I was being, I, I was required to read Paulo Freire. So this question about uh, maestros Latinos and education and who's at the table was something I was being asked in my education, who's here and why are certain people here and why are certain people not present? at the table and Shirley Chisholm saying, bring a folding chair if there's not a seat at the table, are things I was learning as a Latina at UCLA, as a queer Latina at UCLA. Sorry, siren, I don't know if y'all hear that. Um, so, and I'm studying and I'm trying to put what I'm learning, my theory into practice as an activist feminist um, and something that was also, uh, the, the siren threw me off. Um, seat at the table. I'm just trying to like, there's so many pipelines, pipelines and access. As a transfer community college student, I learned, I saw data that showed um, most students of color earn their bachelor's degree in this country, in the United States, starting at the community college level. So there was this big empowerment piece to, we should be here, but historically we're not. How do we access uh, higher education because knowledge is power and having access to higher education is how you know my education transformed who I am and I'm excited and passionate about trying to create that opportunity for other students so it's an honor for me to be able to work at a predominantly black institution like Medgar Evers College because I explicitly am passionate about the work I do because of its ability or opportunity to dismantle racism and white supremacy um, and I had to learn about the Chicano movement and Chicana feminism in my degree we took Chicana feminism as classes in my bachelor's degree um, and that's its own history History. Dolores Huerta was the keynote at my graduation. She got the whole room to do a, a unity clap. You know, we're all chanting si se puede. Um, and that's really different from when I moved here for my master's degree in education at NYU. And the H word was really common here, but where I'm from in Los Angeles, we didn't use the H word. <laughs> and I've, I don't know if anyone here doesn't know what I mean. I mean, where I am, coming from in Los, not that everyone is like this in California, but there's more of a movement not to identify as Hispanic. Um, and specifically using our access to information education to elevate our the understanding of history. And this word from the colonizers of being of Spain, Hispano, is not something we're, we're gonna intentionally say we're not, we're not from Spain. Those were the colonizers, we're Latin American, which is its own complicated <laughs> identity. And I was strongly drawn to Latina because I'm not Chicana. And I was in a context where a lot of people are Chicana and Chicano. So um, that was another thing I, I learned about my privilege as a South American in um, California, because I could, I, I'm light, I, have, I, call, I say I'm light POC. <laughs> I'm a light person of color. I know I have skin privilege. And that's an important part of the conversation, in my opinion. The And it, it came up with what you were saying in the history, um, colorism. And in my opinion, the strategic, explicit, purposeful division by color 
of people to say, well, let's have the, the brown folks and the black folks fight with each other and that benefit white folks, period. So, so Latino could be any race, but in, the, in our popular conscious, a lot of people hear the word Latino, Latina or Hispanic and imagine a particular kind of person. And that imagination of what we, that image is political. It is a political statement. And I, I would, I like unpacking that. We might keep unpacking that here. Last thing I'll say is I was a student intern at our LGBT center at my undergrad and it was run by white folks. And I didn't feel like I could, they didn't know how to talk about race or racism. And then I was a tutor in our HEOP program where they didn't know how to talk about gender or sexual orientation. I felt like I was pulled. Like I, part of me is welcome here and part of me is welcome there. But my, where can I be my whole self? And I love asking my students that question. Where can you be your whole self? Who, who are the people in your life that welcome you as your whole self, your intersectional, multifaceted, complex whole self? We all have a sexual orientation. We all have a gender. We all have a race, ethnicity, an ability status, a national origin, right? So that full, full comprehension of how our intersection, intersecting identities position us in the society we live in, I think is critical for us to understand our power, our privilege, and how we can create change. Um, I'm gonna stop there. I don't know if I answered your question. No, <laughs> but I'm I mean, excited. This is the, first of all, thank you, uh, because there's just so much to unpack. Uh, and, you know, we are not, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, impose strict, I mean, uh, 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 sort of rules and cut you off when the green light, you know, goes off as if it were a conference. I want this to be conversational insofar as the time allows. And I know that there are scheduling issues, so I want to get everybody to talk in, in due course. But this is important to sort of talk about this because you speak about whole person. And I think that's a really uh, important uh, uh, concept because even in my own experience with language, sort of the linguistic aspect, there was not, there was a, there was a sort of obscuring of certain elements that I had to go dig myself over the course of my life and understand that there was an indigeneity to that and an Afro-Latini that to that. And, and there are obstacles that, depending on people's pers uh, 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 perspectives and, and backgrounds, present themselves, right? Whether it's uh, unconscious or unconscious, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the tapestry, right? And some of those uh, uh, um, threads are, are hidden under other ones in many cases, right? So, so with that, uh, I'd like to field that question uh, um, <clears throat> to uh, Jennifer Hernandez uh, to see uh, what your uh, experience and, and your thoughts are on this initial, this is just the opening uh, 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 question idea. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. I'm glad to be here with the rest of the panelists and to have a, a good crowd over here. Uh, but yeah, my name is Jen. I, um, I was one of Professor Herrera's students back in the day. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I come from a, from a mixed status family, right, uh, where, where my parents are undocumented. Uh, and so I think, you know, uh, sort of a, as a second generation Latina in, in this country, right, uh, from a specific uh, socioeconomic background, right, I, I think the experiences were very uh, particular, obviously shared with, with other people, but, but particular. So I would definitely agree that, um, the experience of, of, of the umbrella term, right, uh, that has been constructed, uh, the Latino term, Latine, Latinx, uh, is definitely not a monolith, right? Um, you know, as a first generation person to go to college, right, like there were certain barriers that I had to figure out, right, certain economic barriers, uh, uh, just information barriers, uh, that that I had to to deal with, um, so I think you know definitely depending on on who you are on your different identities and 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 the time you're living the place right even even in other parts of the country right the experiences of, of being Latino Latine uh, are very different right uh, so I think similar to uh, Christina right. Uh, Right. Once I started, once I went to grad school, right, and met people from the East Coast, well, the West Coast, it was like, oh, you know, there's this whole Chicano movement, right, and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, I think we, we definitely have different experiences throughout, throughout the country. 
Uh, and again, depending on, on what part of family you're from, right, where you come from, where you live, um, you know, I think, again, uh, you know, I, I have had the privilege of being born in this country, right, but, but saw a lot of the inequities, right, of, of uh, migration status, right, with, uh, with my parents, right, uh, navigating some of that with them, supporting them, and some of that with them. Um, and so I just, you know, again, very different, different experiences, right, depending on language access, immigration status, uh, you know, work, right, what type of work you do, like all of that stuff, um, very, very different. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think obviously we, you know, there's no particular narrative, right, that I think we, we can push uh, or can we be pushed, right? Like there are many narratives, right? And I think that, that representation of, of the variety of those narratives is important uh, in many spaces, right? And even in education um, institutions, right? Depending on, it can be a Latino, Latina, Latina, and, and, and still not, right? Uh, have knowledge of the history or of the struggle of particular uh, groups of people, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a complicated issue, right? Uh, like Christina said, you know, their whole, whole careers on this, uh, not a two hour panel or whatever it is, right? But, uh, but yeah, I think it's important to, to think about the different experiences to impact them and to really um, think beyond our own, our own experience. Um, but yeah, looking forward to a conversation questions later on. I think people uh, have a lot of questions. Yeah. I mean, yes, this is this is somebody's this is multiple people's dissertations. This is, you know, uh, this is something that um, <clears throat> you know, whole departments are dedicated to or being built up over. But I don't I think you you do you you minimize your own experiences. I think one of the things that uh, this sort of initial uh, uh, um, session does is sort of take it down from the abstract because I think one of the things that we want to talk about is how you know it can be sort of uh, an academic exercise in some circles but here talking to towards the experiences of people uh, um, yourselves uh, Latinos Hispanics throughout the, the country is important to sort of uh, uh, um, concretize it right to reinforce uh, having it be uh, something that you might read in a white paper right or a policy paper uh, um, having these voices, your voices uh, are extremely important. And so again, I thank you for that, Jennifer. And, and yeah, we'll pepper you with more questions the more we develop going forward. And so again, this, this idea of uh, uh, this experience, the legacy, right? It, it's open-ended, right? And so uh, how it relates being Latina, Hispanic, Latinx, right? Uh, um, how it resonates. I, I'd like to uh, um, feel that question to uh, our, our fourth panelist, uh, Talisa Veliciano. Um, thank you for having me. And um, it's really nice to hear everyone's perspective. Um, I think for me, my experience has been one that is very much um, dependent on, on my experiences growing up. So I was born and raised in New York, which I'm very proud of. I'm a CUNY alumna. Very proud of that. Very proud to be on the opposite side and teaching at CUNY now. Um, and I think it's deeply important. Um, I love to be, for my students, um, some type of representation that I had always been searching for in my educational career. Um, you know, I have, I have experience of like, just in a very basic level of, of having teachers like mispronounce my name all my life. And that's that's very difficult. And I think that that's not, necessarily just unique to me but what I'm trying to speak to is is the ways in which we are recognized or not um, in certain institutions um, you know as a child I uh, my family is of Boricua we're very proud of that we're um, mostly independentistas right so for us colonization hasn't ended unfortunately but it's still um, something that we struggle against um, my particular family, uh, we are, or me and my siblings were mixed race. Our father is a black Boricua, my mother is a light-skinned Boricua. Um, 
and we have always sort of really held to our um our latinidad our puerto ricanness very tightly um i remember when i was younger um my mother was very instrumental in politicizing me and uh i used to be so angry that i would um refuse to do the pledge of allegiance um in protest as a child and i got in trouble for that sometimes but i i remember being um being sort of really impassioned to resist this assimilation um i went to school with a lot of people from south america um, or latin america who um you know were english language learners and knew spanish and kind of like teased me for not knowing spanish uh i was i'm a receptive bilingual person and i eventually did learn spanish right um but just uh thinking about my own trajectory and the ways in which me my peers have really tried to resist assimilation um despite sort of understanding that maybe assimilation is the way that we get you know up the social ladder maybe assimilation is the way we get just better quality of life you know um so what are the ways in which we can resist that um this idea that i believe christina uh brought up of being pulled apart in many ways of like not feeling like i'm from here really or from there like where do i belo belong where do i place myself um has been instrumental sort of like in my trajectory right and and also like acquainting myself with like the possibilities right of who i can be i think of i like to think of um this again as something that is more vast and expansive rather than exclusive and measured by like you know who speaks the language and who doesn't speak the language and do you have roots there and do you know your people because sometimes we don't know our people and sometimes the ways in which we survive have been have required us to forget have required us to sort of um misname ourselves in certain ways um and so i i think of the work of um of grasping at that right of of trying to relearn a mother tongue that maybe um i felt alienated from and saying no i'm here i'm present and you know this is who i am and you you have to accept the fullness of that um and you know i think sometimes there's resistance in the community for that there's resistance from different parts for different reasons um and even in that sort of uh clashing right there is something to learn and there's something to grow out of that thank you so much um there there's there's far too much i'm like i'm i'm, I'm like floating in so many different questions and and I'm hoping that uh, we can have a, a round two already, like because I know that there's going to have to be that, you know, in a live forum. But um, this uh, who you can be, and sort of the way that that you, uh, uh, um, Talisa, sort of pose sort of the modernity of the identity, right? I, I I gave a little presentation about the deep antiquity, but like you said, the mother tongue, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily even necessarily have to even be Spanish per se, right? It could be Nahuatl, right? It could be, you know, uh, elements uh, that are people trying to recapture uh, uh, different uh, um, lost languages or uh, languages that have been assimilated uh, and, and reforming it in a modern context. And I think that is something that, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, far more than just trying to recapture something that, as you said, tragically may be lost, right? And has to be reconstructed in a new way uh, is something that informs living in New York City right now as a Latino, right? And and, and sort of the, the dynamic uh, and the, the sort of obstacles or the opportunities that are presented to Latinos to Hispanics uh, uh, in, in New York City specifically uh, is something that uh, um, uh, a bear sort of, sort of digging into, right? The, the different uh, um, as as Secretary Cardona said, the different sort of challenges, the inequities, even in New York, what are the different uh, um, challenges that that you all identify here? You've already mentioned some, but you know, walking through you know New York City, uh, you know, I, I I was just talking to my friend Joey, who identifies uh, identifies himself as Boricua, and then I have uh, uh, another friend of mine who's Quiche Maya, right? And, and he's and he's speaking. You know, to me, we're all speaking in 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 Spanish, but there are slight differences, and some of those 
uh, are significant for various reasons. And how does that play into sort of the modern New York Latino community, if you will? And so this idea of what Cardona, Secretary Cardona said of iniquities and, and challenges, how do these challenges in your estimation, all, all four of you here, right, how does it relate to immigrant status, right? How does it relate to you know, folks that have been here for multiple generations, folks that may have a sort of mixed status, as, as Jennifer said, uh, um, folks that are coming here right now and residing over in, in parts of New York as a result of the sort of <clears throat> national, you know, politicking that's going on in the national, so the movement of peoples. How does that, how is that reflected here? What is your perception? What are the different uh, uh, attitudes that you have seen uh, uh, reflected in the in the community, right? And so I want that uh, um, uh, initial question with respect to immigration, sort of second generation, first generation, very <clears throat> recent generation. I want to I want to, um, Commissioner Castro to sort of feel that first, since you know you're you're there as the commissioner of the office. So I'd like to hear what you have to say on that matter. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, perhaps you know, since since it feels like we're in a very um, almost like a classroom setting and perhaps we want to uh, we want to put on our sort of like critical analysis hat I guess you know um uh, you know I, I've been working on wel welcoming asylum seekers uh some of you may may have been following um over 15,000 asylum seekers have come from the U.S. Mexico border to New York City many of them on these buses that Governor Abbott is chartering to bring them here. Now, um, you know, this is an issue that I've been following for many years since before I was appointed. You know, I understand the issue very closely. I haven't had the, you know, an experience myself as a child crossing the border and living undocumented. And, and you know, it, so this, this is not something that I was surprised by, by you know, Particularly the, the 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 taking of this issue and politicizing it as Governor Abbott and and others have done. What has taken me a, a bit by surprise is somewhat that the response that that lat, some <coughs> Latinos right have uh, you know um, you know I don't want to say the majority or 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 a small amount because I frankly don't know right but some Latinos have expressed a worry that, you know, uh, we are perhaps uh, supporting asylum seekers more than than those Latinos that were already here, right? Uh, and it was, it's been interesting because, uh, you know, I did one of these interviews with Telemundo where they like, they showed me like clips of them interviewing folks in the street, Latinos in the street, right? And their reactions. And then they, they asked me, well, how do you respond to this, right? How do you respond to people saying, well, there's too many people already, right? Or like citizens should come first or New Yorkers come first. And these are other Latinos. And I think this is something that that the that both Univision, Telemundo, and others are grappling with, right? And that's been fascinating, you know, because of course, you know, uh, I have to respond with like, well, you know, New York welcomes hundreds of thousands of, of immigrants every year, you know, people come and go, this is a very different situation, this and that, but it really has struck me as, as, as uh, something that we have to grapple as a community, right? Given our experiences, you know, um, you know, it, it's not automatic, right? That you're, you're gonna be pro-immigrant and supportive of new immigrant communities if you're Latino. Right, or even if you were an immigrant or undocumented immigrant or refugee yourself, right? I take a, a listen at what uh, uh, Congress Member Malia Takis is saying, right? Who is herself a child of Cuban refugees, right? Um, I'm putting this out there as a, as a way to for us to think critically about all this because there's a lot of talk about well Latinos are now close to 30 percent of New York right what does that really mean right does that is that really going to change policy making or is that what does that really mean right and how do we grapple with that um anyway putting it out there 
right? Um, because this is exactly the stuff that I have to address as commissioner, right? Um, you know, and, and make sure that we're also very focused about what we're doing, how we're responding. And, you know, um, I've, I have been, I've been very clear about the ways that, that my own experiences impact my response, my own response, right? And our own policy making, And that's really important and connecting with other folks in the administration who've had these similar experiences and allowing, uh, us to share that with our fellow colleagues, uh, commissioners, and so on, and that's been really important. It's been been important for other commissioners to to get to speak with me, uh, and about the experiences and what my family has gone through, right, as a result of of immigration and immigration status. I'll leave it there. Uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, I do have to hop off soon, and I apologize. I am actually going to talk with the the. Uh, with uh, the the public advocate and the uh, city controller about this very issue, uh, asylum seekers coming in, and it's an important conversation. Otherwise, I would stick around longer. But thank you so much. No, it's uh, thank you so much for for offering that that for for throwing that question out uh, for us to sort of consider and and sort of digest because it is. You say, what does it mean? You know, uh, Latinos are going to be thirty percent of New York City. And and there are there's a, a diversity uh, of opinion of attitudes right and it's precisely that uh, you know that I would argue stems from different folks identities national uh, in terms of nationality in terms of you know uh, origin uh, but also are maybe having to do with as as was already mentioned colorism and 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 all these factors that come from that legacy right that's the point that uh, this this whole a uh, panel is about looking at uh, the 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 impact of casta, right? Whether we know about it or not, uh, uh, the impact of of yeah, uh, different, sometimes almost unspoken of uh, social norms that are promoted in various families. My own family as well, being diverse, yet there's still a level of colorism that I witness even in my own sort of family unit, right? And so you, that writ large to the scale of New York City is something that can affect welcoming asylum seekers, can affect you know, people maybe not wanting uh, uh, various populations in their quote unquote backyards, you know? So that, that definitely poses uh, um, a challenge for sure. But I, I wanna sort of pose this question to, to the rest of the panelists as well, uh, this idea of, of immigrant status, of, of generational differences, uh, of the legacy of casta, the legacy of, of uh, um, sexual orientation and gender identity for that matter, in the way that members of the Latino or the New York Latino community, I can't speak towards the rest of the country because there's not enough time and not enough space, but in New York is big enough, right? How, how is that uh, uh, relevant in your experiences and your interactions with with other Latinos, with people outside of the Latino community, uh, uh, with respect to, uh, um, for lack of a better term, integration, interaction, engagement, right? Uh, uh, um, as this thirty percent, right? So I would uh, feel that uh, we're going to continue on with the uh, in the order, and I would say if Christina has any thoughts on this, uh, please. Uh -huh. Yeah, I shared in the chat, my parents were assim assimilationists. When I tell people I'm Chilena, people will be, oh, did you come to the US in the 70s because of the um, the dictator and um, Allende's assassination? Oh, no, my family immigrated during World War II to the United States, and they're incredibly conservative and support, and my family who are still in Chile supported the dictator. So that's also part of like, for me, deconstructing this idea of the monolith of Latinidad and going to school in Southern California, I had a classmate, a Mexicana classmate, blue eyes and blonde hair, but you know, the word Mexican in, in I'm from Orange County, California, it's super racist. It was a bad word. They use it as a like, oh, are you Mexican? And then you're gonna get treated differently. And I had Mexican friends who never were treated that way till they came to the United States. In other words, they had privilege because they were light or white in Mexico. And then they came to California and all of a sudden by being associated in any way with being Latino or Hispanic, whatever, then all of a sudden they were treated differently. So there are deep specific ways in which our identities are being deployed because of colonization. 
I'm, that's the, my first reaction that I, I wanted to share that because the histories are so important to how specific and different our, our, re, our, our lives are because Latin America is huge, whatever that means. And where I'm from, it used to be Mexico. <laughs> so there's a whole history I didn't learn till college of Mexicans in California who lost their rights when California became part of the United States and were deported from homes they had always known, had always known for generations. And all of a sudden they were foreigners in their own home. So there's all kinds of terrible history and current things happening um, in terms of intersectionality. Um, oh, I wanted to throw, so, oh, you know, Gloria Ansaldúa and talking about borders, fronteras, straddling multiple identities, to me is a critical part of understanding fight, the fight for global gender justice. Chicana feminism specifically contributed this critical lens on mestizaje and this idea that it's complicated. We're not one. There's not black and white against each other. There's a mix of things happening, and that's that makes it complicated, right? The the this is complex, and I'll stop talking. <laughs> but I wanted no. to throw that out there. Um, <clears throat> uh, Jen, uh, your thoughts on on this? I, 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 what I'm trying to sort of tease out here also, and again, this this is we can sort of uh, let this unfold as it may, but. Uh, your sort of there's the there's the general idea the 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 sort of uh, struggling with these dynamics these issues uh, in our own lives in the abstract but also out in the city, right? You know, interacting with folks on the train. You know, interact like you said, like like Christina said. You know, it's like people are like oh, you know, many people would think that you know. Uh, the Latino population is going to vote progressive, and that's definitely not the case, right? Because as as you said, parents are going to be more like you know, don't hang out with those folks. We're we're more conservative than anything. Uh, uh, there are, there are assumptions that need to be dispelled if we're going to understand the true sort of nature of the of this legacy. And so, not just the while it's important the the sort of uh, uh, conceptual aspect, but also the experiential. Is, is there anything that you uh, uh, in your sort of everyday capacity working for, if I can say that, make the road, right? Uh, do you see any uh, um, <clears throat> interactions that have to do with differences in those in that immigrant status? Do you see what uh, Commissioner Castro has said with respect to uh, maybe resistance to accept to accepting, you know, people that might be lumped in to that same group if, from from folks outside, you know, uh, or or is there a general sort of uh, welcoming. I don't know. Uh, I'd be interested to, to see and hear your experiences there. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, uh, right, the, the video talks about inequities, right? I think, I think obviously, uh, we can't escape, right, from the, from the, the historical, right, repercussions of, of the ways that the laws and the systems in this country have been shaped by racism, right, obviously. Uh, in the work that I do specifically, right, I do uh, work around housing, right? Um, most of the people that are either at risk of homelessness or homeless are, are people of color, right? Including Latinos, uh, right? The, 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 that 30%, right? Uh, uh, you know, the, those percentages are big for, for the 30% of Latinos that, that are living in, in, in New York City, right? And um, there is definitely, obviously, a, a, a difference in experience and in treatment and in resources, right, depending on immigration status, right, we have uh, memberships and I work with people that are at risk of homelessness, right, and, and we have not a single voucher, right, uh, that helps people pay their rent that are, that are um, available for people that are undocumented, right, uh, right, they can't access any of the of the resources, right, uh, to, to, to like survive, right, if they don't have uh, employment, right, if they lose their employment, right, there's no unemployment for undocumented people, right, there's no uh, housing vouchers uh, for undocumented, there's no food stamps for, right, uh, there's all these barriers, right, and all this uh, exclusion, right, of, of a whole population of people. Um, and we're obviously constantly hearing, right, uh, people are leeching out the system. They're not paying taxes, right? Like all of these things. And obviously that's for undocumented uh, uh, Latinos, right? Uh, which is a, a, a 
specific population which with within Latinos. Um, uh, and in contrast, always hearing about right the value of uh, the workforce that undocumented Latinos bring, right? Uh, but 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 a system and a government that doesn't obviously want to provide a path way to citizenship, right? And to, uh, to, to these other people, right? That when we were in the pandemic were essential workers, right? Um, so there are all these, all these things, obviously. Um, and I think it was, it was touched on, right? But, um, you know, displacement, right? And, 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 you know, I would love for us or for people, right, to think about the ways in which, right, our government and, and, and our foreign policies in the U.S., right, are a di directly impact, right, this migration, right, in other places of the world, right, and people migrate and, and come here. Um, and, I, you know, I think, I think the conversation around um, immigrants that are already here, right, I think, you know, I've heard some of that, right, I, I think, I think is, um, a lot of the comments are right. Like we didn't have this right when we when we came here, right? Like we didn't have the support, we didn't have the safety net, right? And I think it's uh, you know I, I I don't know an answer right uh, to to that, right? Uh, but it is a true, true experience, right? Um, you know, and I think obviously there, there is a better way that we can as a city, right, be, be, be supporting people that are coming in, right? Like, I'm sure all of you have seen the tent city, right? That's being built, that was built in Orchard, moving to Randall's. Um, right, this is no way, right, to, to really welcome anybody, right? Uh, to have them in, in tent cities. Um, and so, you know, I think New York City, obviously, is one of the most progressive places uh, in, in, in the state, right? But there's still a lot of work that we have to do even within our own system, right? And the way we, we invest our money, right? Uh, we're talking about education, right? Talking about schools, right? The school budgets were cut uh, a few weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, kids are in overpopulated classrooms, right? Uh, we need culturally responsive curriculums, right? Like all of these things, right? Are, are, are things that you know we can we can look to and, and really figure out how to invest um, in these communities, right? And and the Latino community and immigrant communities, and yeah, and all of this. Um, I I realize how enormous um uh these questions are, and 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 I thank you for 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 being brave to sort of delve into this here with us here. So um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and th this idea uh, of education is something that I want to touch upon in a second, but I, I, again, this idea of inequities or the, the sort of immigrant experience, right? Because this is colonialism, immigration and identity. Um, again, I want to I feel that question uh, to, to Lisa here in, in, in her experience as, a, as, a, as an educator, right? As a teacher. Uh, um, in the CUNY system, right? Being a, I'm also a CUNY graduate as well, so I'm very proud of that. Uh, fiercely, uh, um, I, I feel like it has provided opportunities that generally have not been available to many folks uh, where we're from uh, in New York. But have you seen this sort of dynamic? Is there, um, for my part, I've seen sort of on occasion sort of tensions, right? As we talked about there, and, and is that palpable? Uh, um, in, in New York City, whether through the pandemic area, through the pandemic period where, where things may have escalated or, or intensified for various reasons, or just as a matter of course, right? Uh, as, as a legacy of colonialism, as a legacy that we see in the modern day, what is your, or what has been your particular take on, on this over the, over the time, over the, the experience? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I just want to, you know, start by naming that I, I have a U.S. passport. I have U.S. passport privilege, as do most Puerto Ricans. And I think that, um, you know, we shouldn't be centered in this conversation. I think that one of the threads that, um, that a lot of Latinos share is this experience of migration and movement, movement over borders, 
um, and sometimes movement back and forth if that is possible. Um, a lot of times it's not possible. And so I, I do see sort of sometimes a resentment of people who maybe had difficulties coming here and recognizing that maybe there's a shift in policy. And so maybe now um, it might seem as if it's easier, whatever that means. Um, uh, and, and that's a, a basis to treat people differently, to assume that people don't deserve things. Um, you know, all borders are created. These things are not real. They are made real in society and they're used to sort of um, dictate who de who's deserving of rights. And I think there's a threat of respectabil uh, respectability politics in migration, right? Is, is there a right way to migrate? And when I think about the push and pull factors, which I teach my students about all the time, like the, what's pushing and what's pulling, because I think people get into their heads that, you know, it, it, it might be just so easy to just pick up and leave. But, you know, when you really ask people, is it easy to leave your family behind? Is it easy to have to learn a new language? Of course not. You're, you, you're giving up so much. And so these choices are choices um, people make for better lives, for the hopes of better lives. And sometimes they arrive and it's, it's not what it seems. Um, so I think, you know, I think there, there needs to be a lot of work done. I think there needs to be a lot of grace given. I tried to put on my transformative justice lens, right? And I think it comes down to hurt people, hurt people, and these experiences are harmful. And so I think there is a resentment sometimes when people think that, oh, it's easy now. You can just walk through the borders, right? These are things I've heard people themselves, immigrants, saying about others. And I don't think it, it's I don't think it's useful to sort of be playing, you know, oppression Olympics in that way to figure out what's the hardest and, and who is deserving. We're all deserving. Right. I think about the places we come from. They're so rich in resources, but um, we may not have access to those resources. And so we have to leave these places a lot of times. Right. But we're we're incredibly wealthy in resources and. Um, and it is a deep injustice that a, a lot of us have to leave those places. Um, it, it, an incredible amount of work that needs to be done for sure to try and sort of foster uh, an empathy. I mean, not just among Latinos, obviously among human beings, obviously, but um, uh, one's plight and, and, and like you say, hurt people hurt people right, the, the, the legacy of that sort of trauma, if you will, uh, is hard to sort of discount uh, in, 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 in the way people interact with each other, especially in New York when people are, are, are competing and vying for, for these resources here. Uh, and, and like you say, have, a, have this uh, at times deep-seated or even sort of passed down resentment. Um, th this, this idea of, of sort of Considering oneself in this larger context and empathy uh, uh, brings up this um, idea of sort of education that uh, Secretary uh, Cardona had brought up, right? He goes, Necesitos maestros latinos, right? We already mentioned it here, right? Um, and so, you know, it, when I think about that, I'm like, okay, necesitamos maestros latinos or latinas or latinx, but, but what are we teaching, right? Uh, what, what is the narrative? Um, how do we present this complex history? Because it's extremely complex. Uh, and, and obviously we're also bordered by, um, we're, we're East Coast, right? As opposed to West Coast, right? But uh, um, as, as you can see, just by the small sample that we have here, we have folks that, that hail from different parts and come to New York, right? So, so yes, we need more, you know, Latino, Latina uh, 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 masters. We need more POC, <laughs> by BIPOC, uh, maestros in the educational system for sure, but from a sort of curriculum perspective, from a from a sort of a, a, a trying to to uh, uh, really sort of lay out this complex history, how, how do you think or how do you believe? What direction do you think we would need to go uh, in, in the way that narrative is is being sort of presented? Right? Uh, do you see any any Headway? Do you see 
uh, sort of a, any any pulling back in, in certain ways. Um, I know that in parts like Texas, there's definitely sort of an erasure of, of history. Um, but what is it here in, in NYC, uh, especially as it relates to presenting Latinos as, as a monolith? How do we present that narrative? How do we present that complexity that I tried to capture in a, in a little PowerPoint presentation, but failed miserably, right? It's so complex. How does, uh, uh, what do you see sort of in the status quo now and sort of in the potential sort of development of this, this narrative to foster empathy, to foster understanding between various immigrant populations? Where do we go in terms of that narrative? Uh, so uh, I know that uh, Commissioner Castro had to go and I, I'm really grateful uh, that he was here. Really wish I could have wrung this out of him as well because it's a good one to put him on the hot seat. Um, but uh, um, we are not lacking in the in the brain power and thinking on this on this subject, uh, being that we're all uh, we've all been privileged, right? Uh, acknowledging the fact that we have the privilege to you know have gone to higher education and and we're lucky enough uh, uh, to to have this perspective. And how do we wield it? And how do we see it being wielded towards the positive, if you will, in terms of promoting that narrative? So I, I guess I'll stick with the same sort of structure and, and ask Christina uh, uh, her thoughts on this. Uh, I'm just going to share. I studied Spanish from middle school through part of my college education and had zero Latinx, Latina, Latino professors or teachers of Spanish. Um, and I'm actually curious to hear what Talisa and Jen have to say on this topic of education and um, pr teachers, professors in the classroom, especially from a New York perspective, because I'm from California. <laughs> So no, so no, you up I mean, until grad school or up until college, you didn't have that, mm, right, okay. Well, right, and I was in a very segregated part of Southern California. I was tracked into college prep courses, which I, is a huge privilege I had. And I was one of the only people of color in my classes. There was like one Asian guy, one Pakistani woman who I relate. We were like, I'm Arabic, you're Pakistani. Hey, <laughs> we must connect. And where I saw students of color were in my Spanish classes, mostly Latinos. Um, but my teachers were white and from Spain often, or just gringos who majored, who had doctorates in Spanish and were teaching Spanish. And my high school was near a checkpoint. My dad would say, you know, pretend we don't know how to speak Spanish when we were crossing our check the checkpoint you know, pronounce things wrong, pretend we're not, I was told not to tell people I'm Arabic my whole life, even before 9-11. I'm older than maybe people think. So this is part of this assimilationist, we don't want people, we don't blend in if we can, um, which I, I have a lot of privilege as a light-skinned person. And, I, you know, so, and yet that's a loss. My parents speak four languages and they taught their children one. And that's a loss that I think is terrible. Um, I also learned in college that 100 Chicanos will start kindergarten and only five will go to college. And that's, I don't know how that data has changed since I was in college 20 years ago, but that was a powerful part of what's, what's, what, what does someone have to say about 100 little kindergartners? That means they, there's leaks in the educational pipeline that there are not Chicanos getting a bachelor's degree, but the four who do, three of them started at a community college and one went as a freshman to college out of a hundred. That's percentages. Anyway, again, I'm going to pass it. That's what I. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Jennifer, uh, Talisa, uh, you know, you can, you, however you feel, maybe we'll just stick to the sort of sequence just to um, keep people comfortable. So uh, what are your thoughts uh, on, on this, because I mean, this is important, right? I mean, you went to, you were my students, Jennifer. Right? <laughs> yeah. You were in my class in um, uh, ancient uh -huh. of Central uh -huh. South, you know, but uh, is was that the only thing or is, is that the only exposure? I mean, I remember taking a class at Hunter where they called the class called Conquered Peoples. That's how far back I went, right? It was called Conquered Peoples. And I was like, there's something, this rings wrong. Even back then, I was like, this, it, you know, like, but it was an attempt to try and broach this subject, right? To try and deal with it, however ham-fisted it may have been. So that's mm -hmm. my little. What's what is your experience there, and 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 what do you see towards you know augmenting that narrative, or or, or is it or is it uh, uh, 
a um, lost cause. I don't know. All right. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, I want to start off by saying that I had the, the, the blessing of growing up in Washington Heights and going to elementary school in Washington Heights uh up through 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 high school not through middle school and so i did i did have uh you know latino uh, teachers uh i actually um you know lived in mexico when i was a little younger came back right like sort of forgot all the english that i had learned as a toddler um and you know went into uh esl classes right like esl um yeah e esl curriculum um and so I did grow up uh, with some uh, Latino teachers, professors. It, it, it got, the numbers got smaller as I went up on the education pipeline um, of, of that representation. Um, but I think, you know, uh, you know, just obviously we're in a, in a university uh, space, right? But, but the, and, and sort of my, the way I learned about social movements, right, and 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 women gender studies and all of that was through school, right. Uh, but in my role now, right, with Make the Road, right, like we are also uh, working to to expanding those spaces, right, and to really offering those spaces outside of a traditional uh, school pipeline, college pipeline, right, because we do know that a lot of membership that we have, a lot of family that we have uh, didn't have the privilege, right, to be able to actually continue school, right? Uh, not for lack of uh, wanting or, or, or trying or, 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 or anything, right? But because they, they just didn't have the opportunity to continue going to school. Um, and so uh, I think um, we really tried to, to to make sure that we are retelling this history, right? Um, and I think I think that's a good start, right? In in, in elementary schools, right? The, I know that that for us, right, some of our campaigns have included uh, fighting for culturally responsive education, right? Education that really tells uh, a history from from different sides, not not just from you know Columbus Day and uh, you know the Thanksgiving stuff and all of that, right? But really what were the real dynamics, right? What are in the, in, what were the indigenous populations that were in this land before? Um, and trying to really redefine, um, redefine, right, that history, retell that history uh, in a way that, that really uh, reflects the reality more, right? Um, and again, right, I think, a, with our memberships, right, like doing popular education, right, uh, really retelling histories of social movements, of, of migration, of reasons for migrations, all of that stuff. Um, I think it's really important, but obviously uh, the more we can implement those changes and that retelling of history and, and, and the more in the systems that we have of education, right, elementary schools, middle schools, uh, and really redefining that curriculum, I think would be a really good way to to learn better, right? To learn more about uh, people's backgrounds and, and, and the different sides of history, right? That, that we often don't learn. I don't remember learning that stuff, right? Until I got to college, right? And, and, and the more that I've been in organizing spaces and popular education, right? The more I learn about the new sides of histories, right? Uh, and, so, and so I think that that's, that's a, a good place to, to start maybe. Uh, sorry, that was a, a, I didn't know that Make the Road also had that aspect there. Um, it's, uh, it's vital for sure. Uh, <clears throat> because not, not, well, many of us, right, don't, don't get to have, get to this sort of stage, if you will. So having those resources uh, are key. Um, and <clears throat> Talisa, your thoughts uh, on this with respect to the, the sort of educational context, obviously you're in the trenches. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, from curricula, I know that uh, Dr. Diaz had mentioned that there's not that many, you know, Latino 
uh, professors, tenure track or otherwise across the board. And that, uh, you know, I, I'll go to conferences uh, as an archeologist, as an anthropologist, and more often than not, they'll be looking at me as if I were a subject of study as opposed to one that does the studying. So um, <clears throat> again, how, how, what are your thoughts on sort of augmenting that narrative, changing narrative or, or, or how you see that evolving or devolving for that matter? Yeah, I think this is something I'm super passionate about. I think, you know, in terms of what we would need, first and foremost, I'll say we need more funding. Um, you know, 7K per class. I'm an adjunct at CUNY, and I think that the more, you know, the adjuncts are probably more diverse than the full-time tenure track people, right? Um, but also, if you want to attract uh, diversity, you have that, you know, you, you need to attract in order to be able to pay people. We, people need a living wage to do that. In terms of curriculum, I think that it's very easy to teach to a test and it's very difficult to expand curriculum. I think by the time that you get to the college level, there's um, certain things that are ingrained in people as to what learning looks like. And I struggle sometimes because um, I make my job more difficult by inviting students to help me create the syllabus. I ask them, what do you want to learn? And oftentimes they're more engaged. They tell me what they want to learn. It's things that sometimes I wouldn't have even thought to put on my syllabus. And I talk to other people about it. And a lot of people say, that sounds like a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And I think it's worth it. I think that they deserve it. Um, and it's not easier. It's definitely easier to you know, do the Scantron and the Blue Book. Um, but I, I really, I don't think, I don't know what they are learning when they take a test. I know that when I ask them, what do you want to learn? And we look about, we look for it and we research it together that they're more engaged, um, that they're become more passionate, more articulate. Um, and I think we need to reject sort of a, a productionist idea of education that to be a good student means you're producing a really good paper and you can write really well. Uh, people come at, in, in educational spaces, there are at different levels and we need to be able to meet them where they're already at versus expecting them to reach this sort of arbitrary level that they may not have the tools to reach. Um, you know, as a CUNY instructor, I get students who, you know, haven't learned how to write enough yet. So why are we asking them to give us a 20 page research paper if they don't know how to do a five page research paper, right? We have to meet them where they're at. And sometimes we have to flex towards them. We're going to have to um, get together afterwards and compare notes and look at pedagogy because uh, in a mention in free air, Paulo, uh, I think Christina, you know, it, it is sort of uh, um, no coincidence that we're, we're looking at a sort of Latin American perspective there in terms of engagement uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, often goes, you know, unheeded. But uh, um, so again, we can we can go on with this with respect to like identity, with respect to sort of how how we view ourselves, how people view themselves in the New York context, on the national, international context, we can go on forever, but I'd like to uh, um, open up the, uh, um, uh, the questions to people out uh, uh, in the audience here. We still have uh, many of you here, and for that, I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, does um, anybody um, uh, have any questions pertaining, well, to anything? Again, the, the, the topic that we're exploring here is sort of the legacy, right? The, we are in 2022, right? Or 2020 part two, right? The way I think about it with respect to like the pandemic. But um, uh, again, the topic is, you know, the, the legacy of colonialism, the legacy uh, that affects the different attitudes uh, with respect to sort of Latino or Hispanic identity, the, the term itself, or whether the terms that we use are so loaded, right? Uh, I, I'd mentioned myself that, you know, I, I champion mezclado, even though mezclado is Spanish, right? It 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 front loads sort of the admixture that characterizes much of Latino populations, right? If if not all of them, right? Whether they admit to or not. Um, but this is something that uh, maybe 
members of the audience would like to sort of ask uh, the panelists about uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, their experience, their, their, uh, um, their, their work that they do, their efforts to sort of uh, engage uh, with the legacy, right? With, uh, with the legacy of colonialism and, and, and how that affects identity issues. Uh, is there anybody out there? Or is there, are there any people that may have any questions pertaining uh, to the panelists that they'd like to ask the panelists about? Everybody's thinking, thinking hard. You can also type your uh, responses and your questions into the chat if you prefer to do, do it that way. Yes, yeah, so you can raise your hands and I can read them out. Thank you. Ah, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Woodland or Woodland. Would you, you want to, I can unmute you or you can type it in and I can read it out however you would like to. Oh, uh, can I ask it? Yes, of course. Okay. It's Woodland. The first one was right. Okay. okay, so my question is, um, my name is Woodland, I'm a student at Medgar. I am from Professor um, Diaz class, Anthropology, SSC 305. So my question is to the speaker, Christina, uh, let me double check to make sure that I'm not calling out the wrong person. Christina, Christina, um, the one, she was the one that spoke about um, how Mexican were, um, treated different in California. Um, she was saying that um, before California became part of the US, um, she they used to be in their country. I mean, they used to get, um, they used to be treated equally, but when California transitioned to become part of the US, they kind of like treated in a degraded way. So my question to her is like, does she feel that um, New York, knowing that she, I had experience in California, does she feel that New York is more welcome toward different variety of Latina community as opposed to where she when she was in California? I, I think I would speak to US policy as borders. Borders, well, the, Mex the border with Mexico is so um, contentious. So across the United States, any state bordering Mexico has a particular political dynamic that's dangerous for immigrants, right? So, and actually Casa de Colores is one of the orgs I put in the chat, works with folks crossing the border in Texas. They're not all from Mexico, but they're coming to the US through Mexico. And they particularly work with LGBTQI plus asylum seekers and refugees crossing the border there. And they're an organization based in New York, which I think is really interesting. Um, there are other organization, advocacy organizations in California as well. So there's, it's a mixed bag. I don't know, it's complicated. I know growing up, I didn't understand why the proposition Gosh, I was so young when there's a proposition that was anti-immigrant that passed. Um, and I had to learn why, oh, if people SB are coming, what, what, which was it? SB 1070? Maybe. It was a long time ago. It was in the 1990s, but it was very anti-immigrant. But it's this whole thing, like, we're going to promote, the U.S. is going to promote itself as the best place in the world. Everyone should want to come here and then not make it easy to come here unless we want your labor. Oh, actually, we do want to exploit your labor. <laughs> so there's this, you know, explicit strategic way that immigrants are exploited for their labor uh, in, in against other people of color in this country to say like, oh, they're taking your jobs. Who's they? Who's taking our jobs? How about we shift policy so we're not fighting over scarcity? This country has an abundance, but it's all being put in military, you know? and police. So there's not, the US doesn't have not enough money. <laughs> That's a, in my opinion, no one has to agree with me. But if you're asking me, I'm going to say the way fun capital and money is used is in the service of an empire called the United States of America, which is why I specifically put in the chat folks, I recommend learning about homo nationalism, which is a specific concept around the idea that the US likes to say we're going to go to this country and save the women from their men, because the US is more progressive around gender. That's an older thing the US has been doing a long time. And a newer thing, 
Other countries do this too, but the US is one of them. It says, we're gonna go save you from being homophobic because the US is so LGBTQ friendly. Is it though? <laughs> is it? And it's a really interesting, often tragic tension to say, I'm gonna go seek asylum in the United States as a queer or trans person because you can legally be queer or trans here, but is it actually great to be here as states across this country are passing anti-trans laws, you know, right? So it isn't that simple. And people are being asked to throw their culture under the bus in this idea of America's the best in order to be safe. I just need to find a place where I can be safe. And in order to write an asylum letter, I need to trash my culture to say, oh yeah, my culture hates gay people. Does it? Or does the US want us to think that? So then you're gonna say it. So the US accepts your asylum um, application. There's a, there's a lot of, I just threw a lot out there, but I'm at California, New York. I feel like there's nonprofit orgs and advocacy, advocacy groups and politicians who are trying to do the right thing because there's a lot of progressivism in California, but California borders Mexico. And that's a very contentious, violent border. Uh, but and so I'm sorry to sort of just follow up on uh, Woodland's uh, um, question. So obviously California is bordering Mexico, and and that <clears throat> that that level of tension can't be downplayed. Um, <clears throat> do you see any of those dynamics transferring over here, right? Like in in so far as those same attitudes, or or is that something that is regionally specific? Uh, uh, just to sort of piggyback on that. <clears throat> Yeah, there's also more organized Latino pride around the, the word Latino in California, I would say, but there's a little bit this presumption of homogeneity in the community and then Chicano pride. I'm saying specific words, Chicano pride and Latino pride. And then here, the I like to say the diversity in California, my impression is I left a very domestically diverse state for a very internationally diverse state. There are people from all over the world in New York City. And that's unique to the United States. In, in any other city in the United States, whoa, this is an amazing people. It's easier literally to fly here from other parts of the world in terms of where you're just trying to come to this country. So that's, and then, so the Latino community, whatever that, there's not a unified Latinx community in New York. There's very um, divided, that's my impression. <clears throat> um, any other uh, questions? Do I see any other hands raised here? Oh. Again, um, one while, oh, okay, who do we have here? Thank you. Who is that? Uh, Telesia Clemente. Yes, I can unmute you. Uh, yes, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, Professor. <laughs> Um, my question was for uh, T uh, Talicia. Talisa, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to know, my name is Talicia, Talesia. So um, I want, being, uh, bringing up the conversation of names, um, I, you can pronounce my name either or, like Talesia or Talicia, it doesn't matter. But uh, you brought up a great point, like my entire life, I've heard like Talisha or like something completely off than what it actually is. And because I'm brown, I'm of Puerto Rican and Bahamian descent, um, I get the assumption that I'm not Latin, unless you kind of realize my last name is Clemente, then you kind of get it. But with that being said, how do you or how have you personally handled the uh, mental effect of having your name consistently mispronounced in like America in general? Like, so that's my question. Um, thank you. That's a great question. I don't know that I have an answer for you. Um, I have, you know, a lot of survival strategies around it. I go by Lisa in the U.S. Um, you know, when I was 21, I went to live in Chile for a little bit, and that was the first time in my life that I was being named correctly, like by strangers, and it was it was beautiful. I mean, in Puerto Rico too, though they uh, might misspell it, but I can handle misspelling. Right. Um, I've, you know, I've learned that my name might be too expansive for an American English accent. And that's okay. 
right? Um, there's no way that it gets easier. There, you know, it becomes difficult. Like when I've uh, applied for jobs and I've realized, like, oh, when I use the name Lisa, I get more callbacks, right? And so it becomes um, it becomes hard if people deny that experience, right? Which I've been gaslit into saying, no, that's not it. It's not this. It's not that. But it is. Um, my mother, who's on this call, has <laughs> she named me that because I I think there was a pride, right, that she wanted for me to carry with myself, and it's taken many years to um, lean into the power of that pride. So I don't think I answered your question. I'm sorry, but it doesn't get easier, um, and you know, keep correcting people. Tell them no. It's it's, you know, I tell them, it's Dalisa. And if you can't pronounce that, you can call me Lisa, you know? And sometimes I make jokes and sometimes I laugh at it. And I, I kind of, I, I refuse to, uh, I refuse to let it, right, um, decenter me. Because the people I know and love, right, my community, they can say my name. And maybe not everyone has access to me. And that's okay. Thank you. I think I think you did answer it. And I, I suffer from that too as well at times. Um sometimes I would short like my dad would call me Telly for for like short or you know, um, but or T or whatever. But um I had to correct people like especially if they say okay, Telesia, I'm like, okay, cool, you got it. So um thank you and that's very inspiring. So thank you and thank you to everyone on the panel and thank you, Professor. Thank you. Um, any other uh, questions? There's a question in the chat. There is a question in the chat. One second. What do we got here in the chat? From Nico. Uh, Nico Fonseca. Uh, how has <clears throat> how's the identity of Latini that impacted that solidarity and relationship among Latinx communities when it has often been used as a weapon of erasure of blackness and indigenous identities within those communities. Good one, Nico. Uh, um, a, can anybody on the panel care to uh, feel that one? Uh, that's loaded and huge, and that will last hours and days and weeks and lives. But uh, you know, we can try and field it now. Um, anybody care to? Oh, is it directed? At, no, I think it's directed at anybody, uh, to everyone. So. Anybody care to feel that one? Again, the identity of Latinidad has impact solidarity, right? Given that it has, it, for, it, it front loads Latin, right? And no, uh, nobody's saying cogito ergo sum that well, I know of. That's why I specifically brought up that none of my Spanish teachers were Latinos. This is just like weird. And what is Latino anyway? <laughs> you know, Rosalia is not Latina. And a lot of folks in diversity equity positions who identify as Latinx are light, you know, light skinned. And what is up with that? That's a racism. So I don't, there's something specifically about putting it on someone who said, I specifically have that background. So I want to give you space, like Dali said, do you want to have space to speak to this? Or am I putting a burden by pushing it onto you to speak to this, right? So that's what came to my mind. Yeah. Do you wanna? Uh, no. I mean, I think I think it's it's important to remind ourselves, right? That Latinidad, Latino, right? The term is a constructed term, right? That that is used and that was constructed as an umbrella term, right? To to sort of bunch uh, a bunch of people from different places together, right? And, and make it easier uh, to, or maybe easier to identify, right? But I think outside of you know. Like I, I growing up right uh, in my family, like we're we were like oh we're Latino right like we're Mexican right like that's right or we're from Oaxaca or like whatever really specific thing it was right it's it wasn't like like being Latino didn't really or being Latina Latina it really didn't really like I, it didn't fit right until like I was in college maybe grad school right like it was something that's like oh yeah like I'm, I'm latina right like it's it's a very i would say in my experience right and post term 
um, that has gotten less, less, I don't know, uh, that, that, that I, I, I claim sometimes now uh, less or, or a little more than, than before, but, but it's not something that came naturally. Um, uh, but, but, but it is right oftentimes, right? And I think used or, or when people think about it, it's a specific sort of color or a specific sort of person, right? A specific sort of experience, right? And I think some of that redefining is what, what, what we're, we, we should all try to do, right? Like to tell the different experiences, the different ways of being um, Latino or of not trying to fit into the, this umbrella term. I don't know, like, you know. <laughs> Not an easy topic. And again, thank you for being, for, for the panelists. I mean, you knew what you were getting into when we were talking about this, right? Talisa, and did you wanna add something? Yes. Um, yeah, I can add, and this is a very difficult question. Um, and at the same time, I think it's also kind of an easy question, right? How is How do we use Latinidad at, in, in some ways um, how do we weaponize, right, this idea of perfect racial harmony or whatever, racial democracy? How does that get weaponized to erase um, Black people in our communities, Indigenous people in our communities? Um, I, you know, I can speak to um, Puerto Rico. I can speak to, like, communities in New York, right, the ways in which um, uh, anti-Blackness has become globalized and has affected right the places that we are from the places we may continue to go back to right um and it's you know it's it's very interesting because a lot of our cultural aspects have clear african influences clear indigenous influences but how do we treat the descendants of black people living in in the places we come from? How do we treat the descendants of indigenous people living in those places, right? And, and not just like at the interpersonal level, but I'm talking about resources again, like how's access to housing, access to um, running water, access to electricity, access to uh, jobs. Um, you know, someone in the chat brought up something really interesting. You'll meet black Dominicans who will say they aren't black, they're Dominican. The first time I taught at CUNY, I taught up at um, City College, which was a really interesting experience because I talked just about this, right? Um, the resistance to identify with blackness. I think it's, I think it's a recognition that you know, in the United States, right, um, there is rampant anti-blackness, and I think it's another survival strategy, right? One that needs to be questioned because we're you know, we're literally erasing in some moments parts of ourselves, but also um, really important parts of our communities. Can I say something, Roberto? Of course. Oh, <laughs> uh, I just, um, so, uh, and then this kind of takes it back to, to our original theme and with legacies and, um, and colonialism and Latin, Latinidad is a product of colonialism and it, it is, um, the, this, the Spanish language or Spanish culture that links this disparate and diverse group of people from all over the Americas, um, regardless of how we got here, whether we got here as, uh, through slavery or we were already here. I um, mean, they're all linked um, as a result of, of colonialism. And, and so we can't forget that. But on the other hand, um, even though that's a negative, um, we've been able to transform that. And I, I um, I, I appreciate that the, the sense or the idea, the concept of being linked to so many diverse groups of people. Um, and that, that, so there's a positive aspect to this, right? They were linked via language or via traditions um, in the same way that maybe, um, you know, that links other American groups or whatever. But so there's, there's a positive and a negative, but we can't forget the history. And, and that's my point that, that we are a product of this colonial enterprise um, and that's something um, for good or bad that links that has linked us together. Uh, absolutely, and Christina says that Audre Lorde say something about recognizing the oppressor in all of us. Yeah, uh, uh, it it's it is the, the historical legacy is undeniable, 
That's why I threw up that casta. That you know, people look at the casta system and was like, "What is casta?" I'm like, "It's a caste system. It's a hierarchy that ranked folks depending on their level of mixture or closeness to Castile, Spain. You know, and and the closer you were to Castile, the the more access you had, and and that's still in there. In in as I said, in my own family, when people certain people would marry certain folks of different complexions, they'd be like, "Oh, nice, you're marrying up," and I'm like, "Really." That, you know, and that's related to a particular type of color that was associated with the person that was being married and brought into the family. And others were seen as less so. And, you know, people were were uh, 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 emphasized, right? And so, uh, yes, it is a, a very great thing that we can sort of talk about the linkage and the fact that it does link these diverse uh, groups together. But I think the danger, of course, the, is in again making it like, as we see in like voting blocks, right? Or or in demographic terms, this sort of monolithic reality, uh, which obscures that beautiful uh, 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 complexity uh, that is often uh, um, hidden, right? Um, I have a question from somebody, Maisha Alexander. Uh, this question is for any of the panelists to answer. <clears throat> Do you feel like Latinx heritage is taken more seriously in college than it would be in elementary and middle school? Also, would you rather there be a curriculum that teaches kids in America or all over the world today that impact Latinx culture, that impacted Latinx culture whom we haven't heard about yet? So um, thoughts? Do you think it's taken more seriously at the college level? Uh, have you even seen it in the elementary middle school level? I mean, uh, that's a that's an interesting uh, uh, question. Right there. I'm just gonna jump in here just to say because I taught I taught middle school and high school for many years. I was a, a public school educator before coming to um, to higher education, and it's not in the curriculum. And Puerto Rico is not in the curriculum. For instance, mm -hmm. there is a, um, in history in the history curriculum back in the you know I'm talking about the 90s and maybe early 2000s. Um, there was a Latin American component that was part of. I think they were taught African history. Um, Asia, Latin America, um, and this was in global studies, if you guys remember. Um, but it was basically, it, it was very abbreviated. Uh, it was not, it was, it was very, very extremely limited. Um, and then it was on the individual um, teacher, whether they want to expand on that or not. And of course, I always did because I'm not being that. But, but most people did not, right? It was just very abbreviated. They celebrated Cinco de Mayo, some, some symbolic kind of holidays, and that was that. That was the end of it. Um, I'll let the others answer whether they think there should be more or. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you, for, for, for the panelists, did you see, does it even exist at the middle school level? Does it even exist in anything outside of the, the curriculum that, that we're talking about crafting, you know, and, 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 and promoting at the college level? And, and, you know, what challenges do you see, you know, uh, in, in trying to implement that? I, I, again, if from a New York perspective, because I know there are challenges, they've eradicated, like Arizona and, and Texas have like actively erased uh, uh, Latin America, you know, Latino history, Latinx history, you know, as, as part of policy, you know, but like here, um, do, you, do you see that there? Again, um, <clears throat> does it exist? I can speak to my experience um, being educated here. I, I went to a Catholic school for primary and middle school. So all my teachers, even though the majority of our my classmates were um, from Latin America, from the Caribbean, from the English and Spanish speaking Caribbean, um, all of our teachers were white Irish or white Italian people. So we didn't get any, what would be called culturally responsive education at all. Um, I don't recall ever having a, Latinx person teaching history um, ever. I think, you know, uh, it was, I, I had always been searching for my history in like global studies or any kind of history. I just wanted to learn a little bit more. I think the closest I got was uh, we read once when I was Puerto Rican, it was taught by a white woman. Um, so you can imagine how that went. Um, and then I think there was like one paragraph in global studies where it, it, it said something along the lines of like the U.S. benevolently accepted Puerto Rico as part of as a territory. And I remember I got in trouble that day because I was like, no, my mother taught me it was a, we were invaded. Um, I got kicked out of class. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think the curriculum is a great step. 
But if, if the curriculum is being taught by individuals who are not invested in the community, then it only goes so far. Thank you, Talisa. Um, uh, Jen, do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I I didn't see it growing up. I'm not I'm not too connected to the to the current curriculums in elementary, middle school at the moment. Um, uh, I do know there is some work that's being done to to like change curriculums, right, and and really offer. Um, um, again, just culturally sensitive uh, uh, curriculums. Uh, at Make the Road, we have a specific branch of work that does work with youth um, in, in some high schools in the areas that we work in and, and, and do some more of this uh, education. Um, and so I, I put a link down here. Uh, Can I ask areas, Jen? I'm sorry, which areas are you, are you working in? Sorry. Uh, so we, we have a, a collaboration with the Bushwick Campus Community School um, and, and provide some some um, services and some uh, help with curriculum there. Um, yeah. I didn't but, mean to cut you off. I just wanted to no, know no. where where uh, where Make the Road is working because that's the main that's the main uh, uh, high school. Um, and then um, we support some other programming, but but right now that's sort of the main the main campus and uh, youth uh, start to learn. Uh, some organizing components that to uh, support some campaign right, and, and do that kind of work. I have two more questions here. Um, and one, the one is from Christina uh, Romans to everyone. Uh, what advice will you give to your young, would you give to your younger self being raised as a minority in a society that is not always receptive to indigenous people? Advice that can be helpful to the new generation uh, who may face the same struggles you did? Uh, what are some ways they can cope with being deemed as less than or not equal? Again, like questions. That's deep. That is deep. Mm -hmm. I don't know if either of the other folks want to jump on that. Find find your community of care and build or and or build build the community of care that you need and that the folks are be part of a community of care who keeps us safe we keep us safe whatever the policies and politics surrounding us that we can fight to be better uh, we can keep showing up for each other thank you um <clears throat> Um, I would say try to find your voice. Um, don't let, do not remain silent, right? Because I think it's Audrey Lord, right? Who said that, you know, if you remain silent, they'll kill you and say that you liked it. Something along those lines, I'm paraphrasing. Um, really, and, and sometimes, you know, being a part of a community is how you find that voice, is how you articulate um always speak up you know correct people tell them how to pronounce your name um ask the questions that you want answered and it you know it will you you do need a, a level of resilience right because you're going to get pushed back but i think that that's why we have community right to support each other in that Thank you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. These are these are not easy questions. These are very uh, deep questions. Um, I would say depending on how young, uh, but but um, I would say you know I think from personal experience something that really helped. Uh, with this growing up was uh, my parents would send us to Mexico, right, during the summers, right, and so really, really getting to know um, some of the family, like getting to know some of the history, right, of, of, of uh, some ancestors, right, and, and family that came before, um, really getting to know, like, sort of 
the hardships or, or the stuff that they had to go through, I think really made me um, think about just how strong and resilient, right? People have had to be, right? And really take some pride in, in, in that. Um, and then that uniqueness, right, or unique experience or, or, or that kind of cultural, uh, whatever belonging that, that I had. Um, I think, you know, as young people, sometimes we spend too much time like trying to simulate or trying to, or like being ashamed, right, because we don't understand it. And, and, and but these are actually the things that like, make you unique later on in life. And so I think, you know, just thinking about these things, um, just really asking questions, right? And, and really, yeah, finding that community or making that community. Um, but yeah, just just getting to know those unique histories, I think was, was helpful for me. Uh, I don't know. Thank you, Jen. I know it's it's tough to field such deep questions. Uh, I, if I may, I I, uh, I just wanted to add to this because um, um, it helped me deal with the sort of indigenous side. New York has now, granted, museums have a whole host of problems. Talk about uh, uh, expressions of colonialism. However, use the tools against them, if you will, if you're going to say that way. Like I was able to go to museums and see the splendor, granted housed in foreign, you know, cities, but go there and see the the, the variety of cultures that exist, you know, bringing students to, to the museums, to these cultural events, to the things that New York does, does well, at least prior to the pandemic. And hopefully after, you know, we get out of this as well, to utilize that, even though it may be, people may be gatekeeping it, People may be, you know, hiding it behind academic jargon, right? People may be, you know, paying, asking you to pay money for it, you know, in some ways, you know, by, by hook or by crook, find those resources, find those, those, those fonts of information uh, and, and immerse uh, uh, oneself in, in, in that because um, it, that's an alternative narrative. It is not the, the sort of, you know, the, the classic sort of American narrative. It's, it's hidden often in natural history museums, labeling it as natural history, but um, it is part of, of American history, Latin American, Latinx, mezclado history for sure. So it's there, you just get, definitely utilize it. Um, it. I have a couple more, we're, we're coming up four minutes here. Um, Christina Chalamet, National Museum of American Indian, right? Uh, incredible, indigenous, indigenous people's day is coming up, right? So make it a, Make it an opportunity to go and check and check that out, right? And again, not just like as I presented earlier, sort of the deep antiquity, because we are mezclado, right? We're talking Garifuna culture, we're talking about Caribbean culture, the the, the entire sort of admixed uh, uh, modern reality that incorporates this, right? It's out there, especially in NYC, um, even if people might not be promoting it as such. Um, somebody had one last question here. Uh, I note the Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, another anthropologist that I have to deal with a lot. Um, um, oh, uh, Galonia Dent oh, yeah. asked, what do, "What do the panelists think of the role of science education? What, how does how does that how does science education play into any of these issues? Does it play into these issues?" And then I think we may uh, sort of end it here. <clears throat> does anybody think that that science education has some sort of impact there and in what way? Absolutely. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, I went to NYU and my colleague Max is, a, is indigenous to Canada and is a professor of um, environmental science. And in their lab, they have a explicit sovereignty-based and feminist-based pedagogy to doing research. And they've published with other indigenous uh, scholars, specific pedagogy as scientists for what it means to do the research differently and specifically. I'm going to throw that out there. So that I, it absolutely matters. Great. Thank you. Anyone else here? Uh, Talisa, Jen, thoughts on this? Science uh, in, in this sort of effort to uh, um, 
You've been yeah. dealing with them. I think science is, you know, I f I'm deeply into science. Anthropology is a science. I'm on the science side. Um, I, I would say that the way we teach science is deeply problematic and it alienates people of color. I think that science education um, has the opportunity to speak to our cultures in particular ways, right? Especially when we take indigenous science seriously. Um, I'm reading a book right now called Braiding Sweetgrass that speaks just to that, right? The, uh, the role of indigenous science in biology um, and how, right, the opportunities that that could have to mitigating some scientific problems like mitigating the climate crisis. Um, I think the way science is taught needs to deeply change because it, it is deeply alienating to people who are non-white and it shouldn't be. Jen, did, do you uh, have any thoughts on, on, on this? I mean, <clears throat> again, we can go off, we'll be off for forever in so many different uh, ways, but science in, in, in this uh, effort, in the struggle, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about the social sciences, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, a lot of different types of sciences, I think, again, right, like everything is 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 interconnected, right? I, what came to mind was, um, you know, I think with the, with the pandemic, right, and the vaccines and all of that stuff, sort of the, the doubt uh, in, in science or um, thinking about the way that also, also like science has harmed, you know, communities and, right, thinking about experiments done on indigenous populations, right, uh, for science, right, like all of these things, um, you know, I, I think depending on the science, uh, um, but I think it is important, right, I think, you know, we have a history in, in this country of using science to divide people, right? Or to label people or to put people into uh, races or, or, you know, figure out IQ and intelligence and all that stuff, right? And so uh, that definitely has, has a place in, in this conversation, I think. Uh, like uh, Dr. Diaz says, deconstructing it, right? And, and looking at the different ways. And it's not the sole realm, as I teach, as I still talk to my students, is you know, it's not just a sort of European construct. You know, we talk about sort of Maya mathematics and we talk about, you know, a, a, um, a South Asian uh, concepts of zero and so on and so forth. And the fact that it is a global enterprise, the sort of scientific critical mindset that is the domain of every single person on the planet. But um, uh, I thank my panelists so much. Uh, uh, if we are 601, I'm going to abruptly uh, sum up here. Uh, there's so much to talk about here. I hope, I really hope this does branch out into more sessions, uh, hopefully in person as well with as many people here. Uh, I really uh, am grateful to uh, Christina Chala, to Jennifer Hernandez, to Talisa Feliciano, and to uh, uh, Commissioner Manuel Castro, and to uh, um, uh, Secretary Cardona uh, um, for your participation uh, in this panel. Uh, we've, we've touched upon so many different uh, uh, things. Uh, if anything, it's just a sample for people to sort of think about and, and take home with them. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for participating, for uh, joining us. Uh, a fair number of you uh, uh, hung, hung in there. And, and for that, I am deeply, uh, I'm seriously encouraged. Um, if there are any other questions, you're always free to reach out to us uh, and, and we can continue the conversation. Uh, but uh, I will conclude uh, today's session uh, and uh, um, uh, <clears throat> ask you all to you know, think about this uh, as we approach uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, right? As that is part of um, this legacy of colonialism. Um, and I thank you very much and um, uh, have a good weekend. Uh, every one of you. I'm going to share my screen so I may play some music uh, to see us all out here. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you.